Testing, testing. <laughs> yes. Testing, testing is good. And then this is good too. And <clears throat> do I have coffee left? I do. I guess, right. I, I, I don't like this one. Okay. Um, so I guess we're good. Good morning or good afternoon, good evening, whatever this, whenever this live stream might find you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Parametric Camp, computational design live streams. This is your host, Jose Luis Garcia del blah, 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 blah. <laughs> All right. How is it everyone doing? Arasto, Said, Mikael. How? How are you doing? Uh, last time you were watching this, we're doing Chaikin's algorithm. How fun was that? I did like that stream a lot. Actually, I do love that algorithm. Um, yes, we should get back to doing more geometry gems. I really like geometry gems. Um, I actually have a book that we could use for that. Uh, and also, we need to get at some point into more advanced geometry gems, like, you know, like Voronoi diagrams, the Delaunay connectivity, uh, mesh manipulation, all of that. I, we need to we need to get that going at some point. Mm -hmm. I do agree with you, Mikael. Very good. Speaking of which, um, I would like to bring up where am I here? Yes. So uh, for all of you who might be new to this channel, um, we do computational design live streams mostly every week, <laughs> with some exceptions, because, um, you know, I have a busy life, thankfully, uh, I'm not complaining. But um, yes, so uh, if you have not ever, um, if you're new to this channel, just letting you know that we have a, um, I'm going to change this to never, I'm going to generate a new link, and then I'm going to paste it on the chat. We have a Discord server where we keep conversations flowing every during the week in between um, in between um, streams, and we have a chat. We have a um, we have a, an introductions channel where we talk about who we are and where we're coming from, and I get to know a little bit better of who you are. And then we also have a channel where we share some work. We have another one called Bonfire where we just have general conversation, Victor, whom I don't know if he's on the call today or not, was asking the other day about PhD exchange positions, topic suggestions, and we have a running poll right now, uh, which Arasto very thankfully organized. Arasto who's on the call right now. Good, good evening for you, Arasto, I believe. Um, we have a poll running on what would you like to be the next topics or the next playlist that I want that I will generate here in the channel. So um, full disclosure, what we're going to be doing in the next few live streams is that I would like to complete the introduction to parametric modeling playlist that I started actually a year ago. It's been that long. So it was a year ago. Uh, and uh, and then we took a break from that because we needed to do other stuff, whatever. So I want to go back to that because many of you who come to this channel um, have backgrounds and know how to code a little bit. And we actually have the other playlist that someone in the channel was asking recently about. So in the channel, we have all these playlists. We have um, we have uh, algorithmic modeling challenges, geometry gems, coding gems, and we have this playlist called Learning C Sharp, Introduction to Computer Programming for Designers, which is basically a full introduction to learning how to code using the C Sharp programming language and with no assumptions whatsoever. So if you have never opened a single, if you have never written a single line of code, if you don't even know how it works or how you execute or create a program, then this is definitely your playlist. And if you're a designer specifically, and you're into 3D form, graphic design, video games, and all that stuff, many of the examples that you will find in these playlists are specifically catered to this audience. 
Um, so I think you will have fun and it will be super helpful for many of us. So you're welcome to check that out. And what we're going to do in the next few live streams is that we have this channel, this playlist here. It's your next pillow. Uh, we have this playlist here, which is Introduction to Parametric Modeling, which is basically a way of saying that I would like to introduce you to the art of creating three-dimensional form using parametric algorithms. And it will mostly be based on Rhino and Grasshopper. So we started this list. If you see the video, where is the video? This video was published in June 2020, <laughs> literally a year ago. Oh, wait, we're live. How awesome is that? Uh, that no, not this guy. Not this guy, not this one. Yes, let me stop that. Yeah, that one. This guy. <laughs> Hi. Oops. My name is Jose Luis. Oh, yeah. I Who is that guy? <laughs> Sorry. So, yeah, so we have that, and I only got to the introduction. So, on this live stream, I'm going to get back into recording videos for this. So, it's going to be introductory topics on parametric modeling using Grasshopper. And actually, I have news for everyone. So I am planning on doing a, I'm going to call it a marathon or I don't know, a hackathon or a live stream thon or a record thon. I don't know what it is, but because I really want to get this playlist out in the wild as soon as possible. So what I'm planning on doing is next week from Monday to Friday, I plan on doing two live streams daily. So two live streams on Monday, two on Tuesday, one on Wednesday because I have a meeting in the morning, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, and then I would just want to like go through all the content, record this playlist and put it out there as soon as possible. Um, so if you see a lot of notifications on your phone next week, live stream, live stream, live stream is because I'm going to be recording a lot of these and hopefully finish the playlist and so that we can move on to other topics such as, for example, one that I'm very excited about, which is specifically C sharp programming inside of Grasshopper. So how to create C sharp scripts, um, how to, um, what are the nuances and the things that we need to keep in mind and then transition into how do we write Grasshopper components and natively and how do we create plugins for Grasshopper. I think this one is also pretty important for me because it will help me a lot in my teaching at, at the university, but at the same time, because we have done so much Grasshopper-based C-sharp, I think it will be interesting to have a playlist that sets all the foundations so that we can go back now to the rest of the videos and, um, and then just like focus on the algorithms and focus on what's cool uh, about programming for computational form without having to go back to the basics every time. So I think that's what you can probably expect in the in this coming month um, in terms of tutorials and content. Um, if you haven't yet, and if you are excited about what you may see in this channel, please consider subscribing. Um, it's helpful for us. Please consider turning on notifications so that you get on your phone or in your mail, you get um, notifications about when we go live. And also we post a lot of what we do and what we're, when we're going to be posting on our social media. So we have YouTube, GitHub, Instagram, Twitter, we have everything. So if you follow us, you will be able to, you will be able to, to be up to date with what we do. Okay. Wow, that was a long introduction. Um, any comments, suggestions, ideas? Hey, Salvador. Hola. Andres, como andas? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Okie dokie. So, what are we doing today? Today, we are starting again with the playlist. It's not even here. Yes, introduction to parametric modeling. We're getting back to this. Oh, who is this guy? Um, oh, yeah, no, you're not seeing my screen right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Um, so today we are going back to the introduction to parametric modeling playlist. 
Mm. Today might be a little bumpy because I need to kind of review what we recorded and I need to kind of plan what's going to be next for us. I have a list, I have a script of things that I want to go through, but I kind of need to wrap my head around this a little bit. So it might be, it might not, today might not be one of the most streamlined days ever, uh, perhaps. But anyway, you are very patient people. I don't even know how you, I don't even know most of you, how you sit down and just punch through two hours of me just going blubby, 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 look, 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 look. <laughs> I really, really appreciate that. Just, just letting you know. Um, Okie dokie. So I'm actually going to pull up my list and I'm, maybe we can talk about this together. So uh, oh, I don't have it here. Where am I right now? Oops. Okay, so um, if I open my stream, so I have this document, oops, I have this running document. Uh, in case you're ever interested in this, we should do, I should probably do like more like a GitHub repo or something, but I have a, this running document where I write ideas about what I want to do and what I'm, when I write like, oh, this live stream, I'm going to do so and so, and I need to remind myself to tell people to subscribe to Discord, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, oh yeah, I also forgot that we have a calendar where we announce what we are, when we're going live. So if you want to subscribe to that, you can subscribe on Google Calendar, I believe it's a kind of calendar. So, so yeah. Anguito, hello, Saurabh. <laughs> How are you doing, sir? Good to see you. Am I seeing you today at some point? Are we doing anything? It's super nice out there. Saurabh is a, is a good, real world um, physical friend of mine. That sounded weird. Um, I say we hang out in person. <laughs> That's what I mean. <laughs> uh, all right. So yeah, so all right. Thanks a lot, Andres. Um, I enjoy them a lot too. And then I also have this, I also have this document where I kind of outlined what the intro to grasshopper course would look like. So I think we were somewhere here. I think we were something somewhere here, right? And as you can see, I'm a little OCD as in these are the episodes that I want to record. This is kind of what I want to be saying as I go by. Um, yeah, so and we, bah, 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 yeah, it's a little it's a little a lot. Anyway, so I think, okay, so let's take a look at where we were. So the list is blah, blah, blah. So we have, this is more like intro, the interface, etc. And then this is more the structure of components, the inputs, basic arithmetic. And with basic arithmetic, what did we do? Arasto. Mm. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think we're ready now. So here, handwritten here. We have right. Very. So maybe. From the actual operation. So if what we're going to do now is advanced advanced arithmetics, and we're going to use the expression components. Um, I think perhaps it would be good to connect it to whatever we did here for basic arithmetic. Oh, I need to remember to move my head to the left because that's what we were doing for the grasshopper. Uh, yeah, so I need to do that. The area of a circle, keeping your definitions tidy and clean. Uh, as you have seen before, our definition just keeps doing hmm. a little bit of arithmetic. Uh, so that we, give them, um, we can probably 
continue by doing the circle length, the circle area, and perhaps a little bit more complicated. Um, complicated uh, solutions, complicated calculations, maybe. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. So we can turn. We can probably extend this. We can probably just take this access, this same file, and extend it, uh, and do the same thing just underneath with expressions. Hmm. Okay. All right. Oh. Mm. What was that? I just got all the grinds in the coffee. Mm. That was gross. Oh, this is why we should all abandon coffee, right? Oh, oh that was bad. Oh, <laughs> okay. So, that meme, um, okay, let me shut this down. Um, um, <laughs> Saeed is suggesting that I, uh, I put an ad blocker on on YouTube, oh, I kind of have one. So you see, I have this thing that so if I play a video, you know, I can just skip the ad, like you know. Um, All right. But maybe that one is better, Said. I don't know. Okay. Anyway, so I need to first take my head and move it to the other place. Oh, no, not that one. <laughs> no, 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 no. Wait, uh, not that one. So that one. And what, what's so better? What's so better about it, Said? Um, how is it better? Because uh, it just does, does it automatically. Okay, so okay, and uh... <laughs> where am I going to go? What is the position for that? Hmm. So if this was one. 8,000. Okay. Uh, wait, so I'm a little, <laughs> let me figure this out. Uh, so, Oops. Nope. Mm. Whatever. It doesn't that doesn't really matter that much, does it? So I'll just I'll just um put myself somewhere here, no? Uh just do six hundred. Uh -huh. That's probably good enough. So this is going to be oh mm hmm oh I see okay so okay am I here am I on the left <laughs> Wait, 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 wait. Wait. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> All right, fine. I'll I'll stop. Okay, fine. All right, let's get serious or something. <laughs> All right, and then I'm back here. Yes, and this works. And um, okay, and I need to probably open Rhino, right? 
So you'll probably want to do some of that. What is this? AI aided fabric architectural fabrication. A symposium. Oh. Interesting. What is this? Friday. Oh, this looks interesting. AI aided architectural fabrication symposium. Speakers Gabriela, Nathan, Victor, Lydia. Huh. I guess I only know Nathan. This could be interesting. Uh, all right. And how do you sign up for this? Oh, okay. So I'll just. Um, this looks interesting. AI, fa okay, I'm just going to do some random free advertising. This looks interesting to me. AI aided fabrication for architecture. You may want to check it out. Um, uh, uh, yes, okay, so I'm just going to put it here on my to do list for me to check it out later. Uh, okay, and then what the hell is this? Okay, I'll res uh, okay. So I'm here and I will have some grasshopper and yep, I'm using a more advanced Firefly version than that one. So, and I probably want to bring in the examples from that time. So probably I want to bring in this ones, right? Yes. And these ones are a little too obvious. Uh, so I'm going to save this somewhere. What day is it today? Sorry, folks, for all the back and forth. I'm a little, I'm a little, I just, I literally just jumped in. Um, so I'm a little all over the place today. It's going to be an easy, an easy day, I think. And also, I will have to jump off. I have a meeting uh, <laughs> actually with Mr. Saurabh Matre, who's on the call, a fit meeting in, 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 in the real world. So um, I may have to leave. It's going to be a short one today. We're just going to, it's just going to be a warm up. Okay. But remember, uh, if you just jumped into the live stream, remember that we're doing a live stream fun, if that's a word. Uh, we're doing a marathon of live streams next week. I'm going to be live streaming every day for two two days uh, two times every day, and we're gonna get over with um, we're gonna get over with introduction to parametric modeling in Grasshopper. Okay. So what is this going to be? Advanced arithmetic. Okay. Mm -hmm. How did I start? Yeah, I'm really, really reconnecting here. How did I start the... Good. I think we're ready now to start doing some yeah. basic arithmetic. We want, basically has... I didn't... And also... Yeah, I didn't even introduce them that much, right? So I didn't have like a formal introduction. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Okay, so I can just get on it probably right away. All right. So I guess we're ready. <clears throat> and we were going to do, uh, okay, more complex calculations, expressions, and spraying control of multiple inputs, lookup table. Okay. Okay. All right. Are we ready, folks? I think we're doing this. Um, yes. <clears throat> Okie dokie. Wait. I feel like... Wait. The size of my screen... It doesn't matter. I feel like that one was bigger than this one. Oh, okay. 
くちょくちょくちょくちょくちょくちょくちょくちょくちょく。Sorry, sorry, I got distracted. Um, um, yes, it doesn't matter. I, even if I'm a little smaller, who cares? Um, so, advanced arithmetic. Let's say we want to do a more complex calculation. And actually, I can probably full screen this, right? Because we don't have anything on the, on the Rhino viewport, really. <laughs> Said, really? <laughs> uh, you're right. I sometimes worry about myself too. <laughs> what can I do? It's a, you have to understand, folks, it's a very lonely. I'm just sitting in my room. There's no one. In my, I'm in my apartment right now. There's no one in my apartment. I have like a bunch of screens. I'm talking to myself. If it, it is. If it wasn't because of you, <laughs> I would basically, I would definitely lose my sanity at, at some point, I think. Anyway, shall we do this? <clears throat> okay. Oh, ho. <sighs> okay, wonderful. So, so far, we have learned how to do simple arithmetic by uh, using simple mathematical operations to add, subtract things. And then we have also learned how to combine them to do more uh, complex arithmetic operations, such as, for example, um, calculating the length of a circle or the area of a circle, right? Um, however, um, in... However what? However what? Um, however what? Okay, so let's start over again, starting over again. <clears throat> Wonderful. So, so far, we have learned how to do simple arithmetic by using the mathematical operators to just add, subtract, multiply numbers together and do a little more complex operations, such as calculating the length of a circle and the area of a circle by combining multiple of those operations together, one after the other. Now, you can imagine how, depending on the operations that we might be doing, this can get actually really complex. It can get, it can become, they can become operations where we have to chain actually a lot of multiple operators, one after the other. And depending on what we're doing, it may actually get a little, you know, uh, messy or busy in our screen. So it turns out that when we want to create more complex calculations, we have a different options. We have different options instead of um, using all these components and chaining them together. We can do it in a more elegant and perhaps even easier to understand visual way than using components. And we have this alternative called using expressions. So if you go to the math, to the math tab and you go to the scripting tab, you can see that we have the expressions component. This component is perhaps a little daunting because it's much larger, but what this basic, what but this component basically does is that it gives you a way to write um, mathematical equations, if you will. It's not exactly that, but it kind of looks and feels like mathematical equations. So the way this works is that, first of all, you have a set of inputs here, and then you have the window where you can, you can type in your equations. So for example, let's say that I want to mimic the, 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 the calculating the length of a circle. If that's what I want to do, the only parameter that I need to calculate the length of the circle is the radius, right? So what I can do is I can zoom in the component 
And you can see that as I zoom in, in the inputs parameters, these icons pop up that allow me to add or remove inputs to the component. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on this one. And I'm going to change the value of x. And I'm just going to type here radius so that my variable is called radius or it could be called r. And then I'm going to remove the y because I don't need it. I just need radius as the input. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to double click here on format. And you can see that this expression editor pops up. What this expression editor does is that it gives me a way of typing here with pseudocode with more of a literal expression, it allows me to write what do I want to do for a calculation. So if I want to calculate the length of a circle, the equation, as we saw before, is two times pi two times the radius of the circle. So what I can do here is I can type two times and I could do 3.1459 times the radius. Okay, so that could be one way to go. And then if I do that, and I press OK, I you can see that I have an error. Um, let me see if the problem is Yes, exactly. The problem was that I wasn't giving it any information here. And then if I plug in here a panel, you can see that the result is almost identical to what I had in the previous one. It's not identical because well, this one is basically rounded here, but I'm also using a manual approximation of the number pi that I just typed, I just hard coded that. Better than that is using a built in uh, form of the number pi. So for example, if you see here in the expression editor, you can see that I have a lot of things, I have ways of typing functions, I have ways of typing constants, I can choose operators, and I can do simple Operator. So for example, multiplication, you can see that is the same. If I click multiplication, the symbol is just the asterisk, right? Or if I press x to the squ eight square, it gives me like a square operator. So <clears throat> what I can do is I can remove this and I can click here to add the value of pi. And you can see that this symbol pi shows up, which contains a much closer approximation to that value. And now the two values are almost are clearly identical. So now I can turn this into a group. And this is the circle length. All right. What is the advantage between doing this and this? Well, um, I think it's just visual or it's just for the sake of keeping things a little tidy. Um, for me, for the naked eye, perhaps understanding what's happening here might be easy. But if the, if the equation is a little larger, uh, it can get complicated. Whereas for me as a human, at least for me that I'm using to equation, I'm used to equations, for me, it's much easier to read this expression on one go. Similarly, for the circle area, I could just drop an expression component and say, well, I also need the radius as well as an input. So I'm going to remove this, I'm going to change this to r, for example, or let's just be a little radius, okay. And then what I'm going to do here in the expression, I'm going to mimic this part here. So I'm going to say, what I want is to take the number pi and multiply it by the radius and square like that. Or I could also do radius times radius, it doesn't matter. So if I do that, then you can see that now I can plug in my radius. Okay, and then I can plug in my other one and the result is the same here. So for me, as a human, this I find this a little more elegant, a little easier to read than this mess of components. And again, this is for a very simple scenario, it can get more complex. Should we take a look at a more complex example? All right, let's take a look at a more complex example. Uh, um, Uh, which is going to be, for example, the quadratic formula. Uh, uh -huh. I think
think I like this one. Uh, or do we have a Wikipedia, perhaps, version of this? Yes. Uh, we have a Wikipedia version of this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And now my head is on the way here, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, all righty. Lara, of course I'm talking to you. That's what I'm saying. Like, I'm very happy that there's... Um, <laughs> that there is at least some people, some humans behind my screen that I can share this time with. Hi, Chandra. How are you doing? Um, um, all right. So... <clears throat> All right. Uh, we could also do what the the area of a sphere. Um, four times. This is not really more much more complicated. The volume of a sphere. Three quarters of. Pi times radius to the uh, yeah, why not? Uh, the area of a sphere, the surface of a sphere, the volume, the area. Okay, should we do this? <clears throat> I was here, I think. So I can just be like, okay, let's take a look at, yeah. Mm -hmm. Andres, what, what is that equation you're writing there? Are you messing with parametric chem classes? <laughs> and erase that off? Okay. For example, let's take a look at um, let's take a look at for example, how do we calculate the area of a sphere? Well, it's actually the the equation is not that much more complicated than what we've had before. So I'm just going to start I'm just going to start moving this to a nicer. So we have the circle length, we have the circle area, and you know that I like keeping things tidy. All right, so we have the circle area. I'm going to copy the whole thing. And I'm going to say, what is the sphere sphere area? And then the equation of the area of a sphere is 4 times pi radius square. So let's do this here. So this is 4 times pi times radius square. And that is the area of a sphere. What about if we do the volume of a sphere? So let's take a look at how that looks like. So the volume of a sphere is... 4 thirds of pi times um, pi at pi cubed. So how do I do that? Well, so let's say from let's say 4 divided by 3 times pi times radius cubed. Well, I could do radius cubed here, but what if it was a what if I didn't have this shortcut? Well, it turns out that um, actually if you look here in this panel, you can see that you are, you can consult a list of all the functions that are available in this language. So I'm not sure if you can see, I can't really zoom on this one. But what you can see is that more complex mathematical operations such as sines, cosines, square roots, uh, uh, absolute values, means, etc. All of those can be accessed by their literal expressions, like for example, cosine of x, sine of x, of exponential of x, etc., etc. So um, this is a really useful guide to more complex operations. And if we look closely, for example, uh, we can see that here I have power. So pow x and y, which means that returns a specified number raised to a specified power. If we didn't have this shortcut, 
what I could do is I could say, I want to calculate the power of radius elevated to the number three. And this is how in this kind of function call sort of literal expression, I can access more complex operations. So if I do that, then you can see that this would be the volume of an area with radius, whatever, right? And again, for me, this is much easier, much more elegant to read than if we had a similar expression uh, in terms of um, in terms of um, in terms of uh, uh, arithmetic components connected with each other. And you know that I have a little bit of OCD, so I'm going to start like packing all of this here together. And I want to take this and all of this, I'm going to align them to the left. So that's going to be this arrow here. And oh, look how nice and tidy this is looking to me right now. Huh? It's wonderful. Okay. And I think I forgot to add the, um, the this component here. Yes, so that we all can see that these are expressions. Uh, but what if we actually want to calculate a, a really, really uh, more complicated operation? So are you familiar with the quadratic formula? Uh, if you haven't, uh, the quadratic formula is basically a way of solving an equation that has this expression, the expression being a polynomial that with, with a variable x, right? And then three constants, a, b, and c. And if those equal zero, the challenge here is to find what the value, what the value of x is, so that this whole equation equals zero. So imagine you have something that is like two times x squared plus three times x plus five. The challenge here is to find what values of x are satisfy the equation that all of this together equals zero. And the way to solve that is with this expression that it's a little more complicated to do it manually with grasshopper components, it would take a while. So that's why we can try to implement this by <coughs> calculating, <coughs> excuse me, by calculating, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, by calculating uh, the value of x. So for example, let's say that I were to input here um, a slider. So I'm going to type here number slider. And then I'm going to right click to customize the values. And this is going to be something that is going to go from minus 100 to positive 100 uh, with two decimals, for example. And then I am going to crank this up. And this is going to be the value of Oops, sorry, I'm going to this is going to be the value of the constant a. I'm going to it's a little too big. So I'm going to copy paste it three times. I'm going to arrange them, align them. And this is going to be now the value of b and this is going to be the value of c. And let's say that this is going to be two, this is going to be four, I'm going to double click here four, and this is going to be the value of five, for example, the challenge here is given these three constants, for the expression two, four and five, which x, which value of x satisfies that this equals zero. So this we use this formula here. So how does that work? The formula is we would write here an expression, first of all, so I'm going to double click, and I'm going to search and I'm going to drop here an expression, I'm going to change this. So this is going to be a this is going to be b. And then I'm going to add a third one, which is going to be C. And then I'm going to plug them in here, A, B, and C. And I'm going to try to write this expression in my expression component. So I can, can I actually keep those things in parallel? Yes. So I'm going to have my expression here. And then the expression is going to be equal x is going to be equal to minus b, right? And then you see we have a plus minus symbol. This is because the equation has two solutions, solutions that are the ex this expression with a positive value and this expression with a negative value. So we're going to start first with the positive one, right? And then we need to calculate the square root of all of this. I don't have a square root symbol here. So what I can do is I can go to the list and find that there is a function here called returns the square root of a specified number. So I'm going to use 
sqrt and I'm going to open and close parentheses and inside I'm going to specify b squared so this can be b squared or it can be b times b it doesn't matter whatever you want to do I'm just going to do b squared because it looks a bit more elegant minus 4 times a times c and remember that I'm adding these white spaces just because it looks a little better but they're not necessary it's just a flavor and I'm also, now I have to divide everything by 2 times a. However, remember that in computer programming, just like in mathematics, there is this concept called operator precedence, which means that some operations have more importance and they are executed before others. So if you remember from math class in high school or school or whatever you did that, you might remember that multiplications and divisions have precedence over additions and subtraction. So if I were to write this like this, what would happen is that this square root would be divided by 2 times a, and then all of that together will be added to minus b, which is not what I want. What I want is this whole thing to be divided by 2 times a. So that's why I need to remember to add a parenthesis here and add another parenthesis here so that I force all this chunk together to be divided by 2 times a. As I do that, I have my expression here, which imagine what this would have entailed to do manually with just components. All right, and then I'm going to paste this here and this is going to be not a number because um, <laughs> I actually don't know what's going on. Why is this not a number? Let me check this out. Oh, because because oh yeah because um this is probably this is negative and you cannot have the negative you cannot have um you cannot have a negative you cannot do the negative square root of a number you cannot you cannot do the square root of a negative number sorry okay so um Oh, Lara, that's so sweet. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, so let's, let's check that out. That's very easy to check. If we calculate this, and this is a negative number, then that means that this cannot have the square root. Exactly. Okay, so I'm actually going to explain that as part of the tutorial, as part of the recording, because I think that's nice to, to see. Oh, yeah, um, very simple. I had totally forgotten. Um, the, this is probably not a number because it's a value that cannot be computed because the result of this part here is probably a negative number. And if it's a negative number, remember that we cannot calculate with real numbers, we cannot calculate the square root of a negative number. It would, we would get into imaginary numbers and blah, 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 and that's like a completely different deal. To make sure that we check if that is the truth, I can just copy paste and I can change this expression to just calculate what's inside of the square root. So just that. And if it is a negative number, you see, then this will be not a number. And as soon as I modify this to make it a positive number, you can see that we immediately we get the result. You see? So I'm just going to say, for example, this is going to be minus 10. All right. And now this is going to be one of the results. Wonderful. And what about the other one? Well, the other one is going to be the exact same one, but negative with this part. Sorry, this part is here is going to be a negative number. So that's going to be this one here. And maybe for the sake of simplicity or visual, I'm just going to plug both 
into the same comp I'm, I, I'm not going to do that. So never mind. So I'm just going to have the two results here. And this is going to be the quadratic formula. All right. And these are going to be the inputs. Wonderful. So this is great. So this is the way that I typically like to do more complex arithmetic. I like to use the expression component. I barely, if to be honest, I barely use uh, any of the regular mathematical operators anymore because I just liked the elegance and how easy it is to read and to write this expression and also the power that I have to more additional components and more additional functions that I don't have in the Grasshopper toolbox. So um, this is the way we do advanced arithmetic in Grasshopper. Um, so thanks a lot. And let's take a look now at other topics. For example, how do we make actually basic geometry inside of Grasshopper? Let's take a look at that. See you in the next video. <laughs> Wonderful. Okie dokie. All right. So, um, can I take a bio break and drink some water? I'll be, I'll be right back. Give me one minute. See you in a second. See you in a minute. Okie dokie. And <laughs> take a <coffee> break, sir. <laughs> I will. I will. Thank you. All right. What is going on here? Okay. Uh, all right. So, what's next? All right, so what is next? The next thing that we're going to do is, so we got this one, 3.5, and that's done. So now we need to do basic geometry because we still haven't done anything in the 3D environment at all. So we need to segue, we need to link the two videos and say something like, all of this numerical blah, 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 about why this is, can be applied to geometry. And then we can start with simple geometries, such as, for example, create a point from three numbers, create a sphere on top of that point and with a radius, or create boxes, cylinders, and cones. Um, yep, and then that's going to be one video. And then in the next video, I will explain the relation between rhino, grasshopper, baking, and saving, and, um, and um, yes. <clears throat> I think that's, and that's probably going to be enough for today, I think. Because then this one, I need to think about how to explain all of this. And so that's probably more like a topic that we can do next week. Um, are you going to join us in the live stream thon? <laughs> I'm not going to blame you if you don't. It's going to be a lot. <laughs> but hopefully we get over the, um, we get we get like all this content out um, and I that would make me very happy actually. 
Um, so, how are we going to start the video? So we're going to talk about basic geometry. Um, should, should we start from this example? No, we can probably start from, from a new example. And I'm just going to remove this and have this here, save this and save this. Okay, and that's going to be it. And then I'm going to drop some my focals here. <clears throat> All right. And then I'm just going to start talking about why are we doing all of this? <clears throat> and I'm going to start talking about the previous videos. Why are we doing all of this? Because uh, this whole the idea of relations. because we haven't seen any geometry so far, correct? Only the one example we did a while ago. Only the one example is what's, what is parametric modeling? And then I did one example real quick, but that was not. Okay, so let's get to it. <clears throat> On the previous videos in this playlist, we have seen examples of how to create relations between data and between the, which is for blah, 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 starting over, starting over. <clears throat> in the previous videos, we have seen how with this visual programming interface, we can create relationships between data, for example, in the form of numbers and those sliders that we have dropped, and operations that we can perform with data. Like, for example, these numerical operations, adding those numbers, subtracting them, or creating more complex uh, equations with them. Now, why is this important or why is this relevant? Well, it turns out that uh, here in the Rhino and in the Grasshopper environment, it turns out that... Uh, 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 okay, we're starting... We're starting over, starting over. Um, we're starting over. <clears throat> In the previous videos on this playlist, we have seen how with um, this visual programming interface, we can create relationships between data in the form of, for example, numbers that we can control with a slider in an interface, and the operations that we can do with that data. So for example, multiplying numbers together, adding them, or creating more complex equations to calculate the area, the surface of elements, etc. But why is this important? Well, it turns out that uh, with parametric modeling, the idea is that we can work with parameters to create arithmetic operations, but we can use the exact same logic to work with geometry and to generate three-dimensional form that is derived from a set of relationships between input data, what's typically referred to as the parameters, and the operations that we set as an algorithm to manipulate that data. So how does that work? Well, it turns out that, for example, we can create very simple basic geometry using numerical inputs for the creation of that form. So for example, um, let's say that I want to create the simplest form of geometry that I can think of, which is going to be a point in three-dimensional space. What would you need to represent numerically a point in three-dimensional coordinates? Probably the only thing that you need is the numbers that represent where that point is in the x coordinate, in the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction the triplet. So basically, if we are able to create three numbers and then construct a point out of those three numbers, we will have a parametric point given 
the assumption that we can control those three parameters of the point. How could we do that in Grasshopper, for example? Well, very simple. I can just create, I can double click and create a number slider. I'm going to say that this is going to go from, is going to go from, for example, minus 10 to positive 10. It's going to have a value of one, and then it's going to be three decimal numbers. Okay, so that's fine. And this, I'm going to right click on slider and name it X. And then I'm going to copy this and paste it three times. I'm going to rearrange them. This is going to be Y and this is going to be C. I'm doing this just because I have a little bit of OCD and I like clean order things, all right? So this would be the input parameters, all right? Input parameters of a point, for example, the X and Y and the C. So these are three numbers that I can control with my slider, all right? And now, how can I create a point out of these three numbers? Well, if we go here to the vector tab, this is a little confusing perhaps at first. If we go to the vector tab, we can see that one of the categories is called point. And if we drop the point, we can see that there's a lot of operations that I can do, that I can use to create, to measure, or to deconstruct points even. Uh, the first one, the most obvious one, is constructing a point, as you can see from the description, from x, y, z coordinates. And if I click here and I drop this component on the panel, you can see that I have this icon that says uh, x, y, z turn into a point, and I have three inputs, x, y, and z. As we said in previous videos, I can hover over the inputs to notice that uh, it's asking me for x coordinate and that the tiny hex icon indicates that it's a number that this component needs as an input. The same is for Y and the same is for Z. And you can also notice that here, the output is the actual point as a geometry object. And you can see that the hex icon is telling me that it's with that cross is indicating that it's a geometry object of the form point. So if I now put this one here, control this one here and excuse me, and I plug the third one here, you can see, and if I double click and I add a panel here, you can also see that I have a point, I have created a point that has three coordinates, one, 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 and the coordinates are here. But also, and most importantly, you can also notice that in my Rhino viewport, I have now this tiny red cross that represents a pre-visualization of where that point would be in three-dimensional space, okay? What's very nice is that I have a geometry entity here, but it's controlled by parameters that can change. So this is a fully parametric point only because I can control it with parameters that might change. And therefore, the location of this point will change depending on the input parameters. All right, so this is great, but Honestly, I can also have a point here and I can also drag it. Where is the gumball? I can also drag it in 3D space. How is this any different than having a point in Rhino? It doesn't really make a lot of sense without all the effort. Well, maybe for a simple point it doesn't, but you can get a little more elaborate than this. So for example, let's say that instead of a point, we wanted to create um, a sphere, all right? A sphere. Uh, is a surface object. So I'm going to go here to the surface tab. I'm going to go to primitives. And you can see that I have a bunch of simple 3D objects, boxes, cones, cylinders, and spheres. And actually, I have four ways of creating spheres, which is kind of uh, cool. So I'm going to leave it up for you to explore the four different ways. I'm just going to go here for the simple one, which is a sphere, which if I drop here, you can see that I'm going to read and the inputs. This is a very good practice to do. Let me first read what this sphere needs as data. And then let me see if I can feed it to its uh, feed it. So here on the B, it says that it needs a plane. All right. And then on the R, it says that it needs a radius. Well, for reasons that I will, ex so for example, for the radius, and you can see that I already have here a visualization of the sphere, which means that and this is because if I hover over the component, you can see that the base plane input already has a default 
which is the world x, y plane. All right. And then here under R, you can also see that there's a default value, which is one units, which means that this component is already giving me a sphere object centered at zero, zero, oriented with the world plane and with a one unit radius. So this is great. I have the sphere in 3D, but what if I wanted to control the sphere a little better? Well, I could just decide that I want to add a new parameter here, which is going to be a number slider. This is going to go from zero this time because I don't want a negative radius. That doesn't really make much sense to 10 and with two decimals, for example. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to name this the radius and I'm going to plug this in here. You can see that now my sphere is parametric because I can control numerically the radius. But I can also control where the center of the sphere is by connecting the center, the point, to the input base plane. If I do that, you can now see that the sphere is linked to the point that is changing in three dimensional space. And because this point is changing on over my initial parameters, then the point is controlling the location of the center of the sphere. And therefore, I have full control of where the sphere is in three dimensional space and its size via the radius. So I have the four parameters that completely define where and how big this sphere is. It's a fully parametric sphere. Now, and this is the magic, this is the core, and this is the magic of why parametric modeling is important and why it's super nice. Because large and large amounts of these relationships can actually generate a fair amount of complexity and form and interesting relationships. All of those can be being controlled by numerical inputs, by parameters or by input form. And that is the beauty of why parametric modeling is so versatile and it allows for the variability and the exploration of the parametric space that you're creating. Being the parametric space being the combination of all possible parameters that we can, uh, that we can combine together. So um, let's see other examples. So for example, I want to say that I want to create a cone. A cone needs a base plane, it needs a radius, and it needs a cone height. All right, so let's do that. I'm going to, so this is going to be the sphere. I'm going to pack it uh, all the way here. Let me be a little more. I'm going to take this. I'm going to, I'm going to add right here, and I'm going to add this to the group. So now they're both together. I'm going to move this a little here, and this is going to be my sphere creation, for example. Now I'm going to copy these and I'm going to paste them a little behind. And I'm going to say my cone is going to have this point here is going to have this radius. And let me move the point somewhere else. And the length, I'm going to create another component. This is going to be called the length. I'm going to plug it in here. And then I'm going to add this to the group. All right. So now I have a new point. So I have two points. One is the sphere one. The other one is the cone one. You can see it here. And I can control the location of this point. I control the radius of the cone and I can control the length of the cone. All right. One thing I would like you to notice, or uh, uh, let's, let's just keep it there. All right. And then this is going to be the cone. Or for example, I may want to create a cylinder, right? Well, the cylinder is going to be pretty much the exact same thing. I'm going to copy the whole thing. And it's going to be the I'm going to copy here the point, I'm going to pass in these parameters here. And then I'm going to use this point at the center as the center of the cylinder, and then this radius, and then this length. And as I move the cylinder somewhere else, you can see that I now have this cylinder that is also fully parametric control, absolutely parametrically. Okay, I have the three objects. 
each one of them independent. Okay. What do I want to say now? Why did I stop? Um, mm -hmm. What I want to say is... Uh, what do I want to say? Uh, um, how do I want to wrap up this video? Um, Um, how do I want to wrap up this video? Mm. Um. <clears throat> how do I want to wrap up this video? Well, just saying that this is how you create parametric geometry, no? And then perhaps introducing the next video, which is going to be how do I actually handle and manage everything together? <clears throat> okay, I guess we can do that. So I was doing this, right, when I stopped. <laughs> so this that you just saw here is how we create basic parametric geometry. Remember, it's all about defining input parameters, and it's all then about defining the sequence of relationships that lead to the generation of a particular form. In this case, because we have used very basic geometry, it's actually quite straightforward. It's just as simple as creating for the sphere, first creating a point that represents its center. And I've actually, I've actually kind of skipped through the fact that the sphere takes as an input a plane object. And you can see in the hex icon that this is a plane, whereas we're actually giving it a point object, which is two different kinds of geometry. But the thing is still working, actually. So I will explain why that's the case, why sometimes, depending on a particular conditions, how, why you can switch different types of geometry and where and how can you give a particular type of geometry to something that is asking you for a different one? Okay, I will, we will see that in further videos down the road. But in the meantime, um, this is just how you create basic geometry. We will see in further videos how, we can, we, well, how can we create more complex objects with nerve services and much more uh, complex operations that generate more intricate form and more interesting and elegant, perhaps, uh, uh, geometrical objects, um, all of them fully controlled parametrically. Now, before we wrap up, uh, in the next video, what we're going to do is I'm going to explain to you actually, now that we have some parametric geometry in Rhino, what happens? So what do we do with this? And how do we bring it out from Grasshopper into Rhino? And what is the relationship between Rhino and Grasshopper? How can we use this and export this somewhere else? So let's take a look at that on the next video. Thanks a lot. Okie dokie. So let's save this one. So that's going to be 3.6 basic, basic geometry. And I'm going to remove this. Uh, Okay. All right. I can probably remove this. And so that's basic geometry. And now in this. Do I need the. <clears throat> I 
Do I need the to create a seventh one? Well, we can do it just just in case. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think this is going to be the last video, and then I'm going to go grab a quick bite um, and jump on meetings. I have back to back meetings all afternoon today. Um, all right, if any of you just landed on this work on this live stream, uh, welcome. This is Jose Luis. This is Parametric Camp. We do live streams, computational design. Uh, we have social media. Please subscribe, uh, hit notifications. We have a Discord channel if you want to stay up to date what we do. And we have like during the week, we chat, uh, we hang out, we we ask each other questions, we nerd out with code. Um, just join the community if you feel called to do it. Now, what else are we doing? Hey, no, no, I didn't know you were here. How are you doing, sir? Um, yes, we are going to explain the relationship between um, Rhino and Grasshopper. And first, <clears throat> mm -hmm. okay. So what are we going to do? Okay, how are we going to do this? I'm going to explain visual clutter. I'm going to turn off some components to see, and I'm going to click them. Um, I'm going to click them to see how they turn green so that we can see that it's pre-visualization. I can turn them off. Um, and then I'm going to explain that once that is done, I'm going to explain that there's no actual geometry in Rhino and I'm actually, I'm going to close Grasshopper to show that there's nothing going on in there. And then, uh, and then I will explain baking and how, when we bake, we lose the relationship. And then I will explain saving files, which is also important. <clears throat> Okay. Hi, this is Jose Luis. And in the previous video on this playlist, learning parametric modeling, uh, we explained how to do basic geometry, simple geometry using parametric modeling here in Grasshopper. Uh, and we saw how to create a sphere, a cone and a cylinder using simple components and starting off from numerical parameters. Now, what I want to explain in this video is that you can see how just for three simple objects, a sphere, cone, and a cylinder, we already have quite some stuff going on here. And uh, my point here being that uh, very soon, as soon as the complexity in our grasshopper definitions, remember the definition is the file that contains all these components. As soon as the complexity starts growing, we're going to start um, going into what's called spaghetti mode, where we basically have so many components and so many wires connecting them that there is a lot of clutter and there's a lot of stuff. It's very difficult to manage. That's why I make so much emphasis on grouping things properly and giving things names to things so that we avoid the visual clutter. But the visual clutter will not only be on Grasshopper, it will also be here on the window. Because as you can see, we already have like six geometry entities. So I can see the surfaces, I can see their, their center points. And arguably, when I am designing, I may not always want to have all the geometry visually here on the screen. So what I want to make sure that we understand is that first of all, whatever we have in Grasshopper, it's always going to be just a pre visualization. Okay, what that means is that this sphere, this point, whatever, they're not real geometry in Rhino. And I will explain that in a second. There's just a pre visualization of what it would be whenever I make, I transfer that geometry from Grasshopper to Rhino, which again, we will see in this video. Um, it's just a pre visualization. And actually, for example, if you see me close Grasshopper, you see that everything just disappears because um, it's just not, it doesn't exist, right? And if I turn Grasshopper again, everything comes back in. 
So that's one thing. We still, we have a parametric definition, we have ways to work with all this geometry, but the geometry is really not there yet. And also, if we have too much geometry, we may actually want to turn things on and off. So, for example, um, arguably, the points that I use to generate these surfaces are not very important because um, uh, what I actually care is about the surfaces. So how could I turn them off? Well, first of all, the also another thing to understand is that Grasshopper has a way of highlighting what every component by default will show up, whatever geometry for every component we have will show up on the screen, on this one here. Um, but if I, and, but sometimes I may not know if I have many sphere components, which one is which. So what I can do is I can actually click on the components and you can see that the surface or the geometry that corresponds to that component will turn green as a way of understanding that this particular component represents this geometry. And this point here represents this green point that we have here. And this cone here represents the surface and this point here represents uh, this, this center here. Um, this one here represents and this one this point represents this one here. If you are colorblind, uh, or if you have problems seeing between um, red and green, there's actually ways here to change the default colors that uh, are assigned to normal geometry and to selected geometry. So you can customize them here in this, um, in this panel. So that's one thing. If I have a lot of geometry just by clicking on it, I can see which one corresponds to which component. And the other thing that I can do is I can basically just turn off the visualization of geometry that is not important for me. So for example, this point might be a little annoying or if I have too many of them, I can just decide to not show them on the screen. The way to do that is by clicking on the component and then clicking with the center mouse wheel button, all right? And then choosing to use the uh, whatever, the eye blind, the mask kind of icon to disable the preview of the component, okay? There's two ways of disable. You can disable the whole thing so that the component does not work. This component is not producing points anymore and therefore the sphere is also not working. This is not what I want. I want the component to work internally. I just don't want to see it. So that's why I'm clicking on the mask so that the visualization is off, even though the component is still working. And you see that the component gets a darker gray color and, um, and it doesn't show up anymore. Same for this other point. I can click it and I can turn off the mask. Or, for example, I can click the component and I can choose, if you go to, um, I don't know, here, yes, no preview. I actually don't know, but I know that the shortcut is Control Q to disable automatically the visualization. So I'm pressing Control Q to turn it off and Control Q to turn it on again with the component selected. And the same for the sphere. I can disable the sphere by pressing Control Q, disable this one and disable this one. Again, they're still there. They're just not visually represented. So I can just keep, for example, the sphere or the cone or the cylinder. All right. Exactly, Tarike. Um, well, I'm using bifocals to have both things show, show up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what am I doing now? Um, what am I doing now? I am... Uh, what are we talking now? Uh, uh, um, <clears throat> so I'm going to keep only the sphere and then I'm going to this, I'm going to explain the concept of baking. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> All 
Okay, so just to make sure that uh, we focus on the right stuff, I'm going to turn off the cone and the cylinder, and I'm going to keep the sphere, all right? And as I said before, um, the thing with Grasshopper is that I work with a pre-visualization pre here. This is not real geometry in Rhino yet. But let's say that I have worked with this like really nice Grasshopper definition, has like tons of complex geometry relationships, etc. And I have like the final form that I want, the perfect sphere. I have mastered the perfect sphere and I now want to be able to, I don't know, send this sphere to my client or uh, make a nice rendering with this sphere or send it to a competition, whatever that is. I want to make sure that I have a way of taking this geometry that is like the finer perfect form that it's uh, or and put it in Rhino so that I can start manipulating, exporting it and doing whatever I want to do with it. So the way to take geometry from a grasshopper definition and make it permanent in a Rhino file and then use it whatever else you want is by following a process that is called baking. Baking is the act of taking a geometry entity that is parametric, that is in Grasshopper, and that has like all this variability, and freezing it so that it becomes actual form in Rhino that can be used for rendering, for exporting, for 3D printing, whatever that is. The way to do that is you go to the component that has the geometry that you want to bake. So for example, this sphere here, and you right click on the output that you want to bake, so for example, the S, and you click on this icon that has the fried egg, the baking. When you do that, you select which layer you want to send the geometry object to. And if this component had multiple spheres inside of it, which we will see very soon, you may want to choose to group all of them together so that you don't have like a thousand different spheres and you have to click each one of them independently. We'll see that very soon. I, as I press OK, what will happen is that all of a sudden I have this new thing going on here. I'm going to right click on perspective and show, for example, rendered so that I can see a rendered visualization of my sphere. Or I can say, for example, I like ghosted a lot. And you can see that now this has a different quality. I have these surfaces, I have these ISO trims, all right? And I can actually now click on the sphere. You see, I can actually click on this thing and this is actual geometry now that is living in Rhino. And if I close, if I close my grasshopper, you can see that now I have a sphere that is ge real geometry that is living in Rhino. Okay, so that's great. So I have been able to take my sphere and to bake it into a geometrical entity in Rhino. However, we need to remember something very important. Baking is, as I was saying, is kind of freezing the geometry. What that means is that the moment you take a particular combination of parameters, you turn it into a form, and then you bake that form, what you're basically doing is freezing all that tree of parametric relationships into one final form that is definite. And what that also means is that as soon as that form goes from grasshopper into Rhino, the form that we have in Rhino has lost all the relationship that it had uh, with the parametric set of relationships that generated it. What I mean with that is that if I now, for example, change the inputs, the parameters, you can see that the previsualization of the sphere is adapting, but the baked sphere that I had before is not being affected because it was frozen in time, because it was baked. It, this sphere here is the footprint, if you will, of how the parameters were when I decided to bake this sphere. And as soon as I bake it, anything that I do afterwards to that sphere does not affect anymore this actual uh, frozen baked geometry that I have in Rhino. They lose that relationship, okay? So baking, in a way, is like printing. You bake whatever you had, you print it, and then that cannot accept any more changes or any more parametric relationships, okay? That's very important to understand. Um, but what's beautiful about this is that now I can use my grasshopper definition as a way to generate multiple versions of my sphere. So for example, I can now bake another one and I can just have it the second sphere. Now I can find like a third 
uh, way of like, oh, this is another sphere that I like, so I'm also going to bake this. And now I have a third sphere here, which is kind of great, etc., etc., etc. As you can imagine, for spheres, this is a fairly trivial process, but we will see very soon in more advanced videos down this playlist how when you create like surfaces with apertures and things poking out, etc., exploring all the different variabilities and the results that you can find in the different combinations of parameters is actually super helpful and very interesting. And it's one of the biggest powers of parametric modeling. Um, so that's that. And then finally, I also want to talk about saving files. So for example, what happens with Grasshopper and Rhino? What's the relationship between these files? I just want to remind you that Grasshopper files, Grasshopper definitions are their own type of file. So if I go here to File and to Save Document As, it will ask me to where do I want to save this, for example, my desktop. And then it will give me, it will prompt me to save the file as GH, which is um, the Grasshopper default format. So that's one thing. But the Grasshopper file will always be independent from the Rhino file. So in the Rhino file, I can go here and save as, and I, this will be, for example, three spheres, all right? And this file will be independent from my Grasshopper files. They're both unique, and they don't have any relationship between each other. The Grasshopper file only contains this parametric generator of spheres, and my Rhino file right now contains the three frozen, the three baked spheres that I created from this definition. But there's no relationship between each other, and I could always open them up independently um, without the need for them to be together. There's only a few situations where I want to have them together, and I will explain those in further videos down the road. Okay? Um, and last but not least, a tiny, um, a tiny Easter egg. Um, sometimes, for some reason, you may want to actually share a screenshot of your definition to share with people to explain your parametric model, how the relationships came about, how you generated some form. You might be tempted to use your systems, screen shooting system, screen shooting uh, capacities, but um, that's not going to be great because it's going to also take up the UI, it's going to take this like grid, background grid, whatever. So Grasshopper actually comes with a very powerful screen shooting system. So I can export here a high resolution image of what I have here in my definition. So for example, I'm going to say that this is going to go to my desktop. I'm going to call this definition screenshot, for example. I'm going to say that the zoom level is going to be two. The background is going to be white and fully transparent. That's going to be nice because then I can overlay this on a PowerPoint or something. And then this menu popped up on my other screen. Sorry, you couldn't see it. But if I go to my desktop now, I have this file called definition screen, and you can see that I have now a very nice screenshot that is actually transparent. I can overlay on top of other things with my geometry. And this like bifocal component that I'm using to, um, to see, um, this bifocal component that I'm using to have the components, have the icons, but also has, have this label on top. All right. Wonderful. With that, I think we are ready to start looking into more complex stuff. We know the basics of the interface. We know the basics of how to do simple arithmetic, how to do simple geometry. So I think we're done with simple. I think it's a good time to now start looking at more complex geometry, more complex relationships, and how to handle uh, streams of data, not just single numbers, which is a very important topic in Grasshopper. So let's take a look at that in the next videos on this playlist. Uh, but just saying, if you're liking what you see so far, please consider subscribing to this channel, uh, liking this video, turning on notifications, joining our Discord channel, and all those things that kept, keep us uh, motivated and help us spread the word of what we do here. Thanks a lot, and see you in the next video. Yoo-hoo! All righty. Well, I think with that, I'm ready for, I'm done for today. I have 20 minutes to grab some lunch and jump into a 12 o'clock meeting. <laughs>
thanks for being here as usual. Um, and um, Said, the next video is uh, there's no next video. We're still recording. <laughs> We're recording videos. This video, this video will be recorded and will be put on the playlist. And then when somebody's watching the recording that I just did, there will be more videos afterwards. But there's no next video right now. <laughs> we are recording those videos right now. Remember that this video that I these videos that I just recorded will end up on this playlist here. Uh, the introduction to parametric modeling playlist that we're working on right now. Okay. Um, I have a few, I have a couple of minutes for Q and A questions, anything you may want to chat about. Um, we can do it right now while I check uh, some notifications that I have going on here. Okay. <clears throat> um, I know, just kidding. All right. <laughs> so you were messing with me, Said. Mm -hmm. All right. Duly noted. Duly noted. Thanks a lot, Salvador. Muchas gracias a ti. And um, all right. So when we can do C sharp coding inside Grasshopper, that's going to be the next playlist. Arasto, we're finishing basic Grasshopper first, and then we're starting. C sharp in Grasshopper for scripting and for the creation of plugins. Okay. Why would we want to use when we can? Ah, all right. <laughs> if we can use C sharp, why use regular components? That is a wonderful question. Um, to which I'm only going to say that regular components are a really good introduction to the art of parametric modeling, but as soon as you know what you're doing and you want to get better at it, you should definitely do the jump to C sharp programming in Grasshopper. I am absolutely right. I, I absolutely uh, agree with that. Um, okay. With that, I'm going to call it a day. Thank you very much, everyone. It's a pleasure. Um, for those of you who might be interested and can make it, Remember, uh, we are starting a live stream fun or a recording fun or a hackathon marathon, whatever that is. We're starting next week uh, a live stream fun, and I'm going to be record. I'm going to be doing two live streams every day, Monday to Friday, and recording more of these videos and trying to wrap up the playlist. So if you can make it, um, and even if you are maybe if you're already familiar with the basics of Grasshopper. Maybe you can be doing your own thing and have the video in the background and maybe some concepts on some topics are things that you may want to refresh or maybe I drop a couple of things that you didn't know before. I don't know. Or also maybe you can help me while I'm recording the videos to highlight things that we could add to the particular video and make it better. I, it has happened before and it will definitely happen in the future and I'm very much appreciative of that live input. Thanks everyone. Have a good weekend. And looking forward to seeing you again very soon. Bye-bye.